Welcome everybody, this is Dr. Bruce Perry and I'm here to spend about 15 minutes talking to you about stress, distress, and resilience. Um, this little mini webinar is a component of the Neurosequential Network community's uh, effort to respond to some of the challenges posed by the current uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we have been, uh, like many others, uh, fielding many questions uh, about the anxiety, the stress, uh, the distress that have been a core element of this uh, ever-changing crisis. And we have some thoughts that we think will help you as you uh, work with your organizations, work with your clients, work with your family, and, and provide leadership in your community. So those of you who want uh, to learn more about what we're doing, you can get that information at the, the website that uh, is indicated on this slide. Um, we've started this process by having a, a whole set of uh, issues uh, discussed and presented uh, at a large community meeting. Uh, we're now going to hone in and have a number of uh, shorter uh, learning opportunities. And today I'm gonna to focus on stress and stress activation. Um, the, the key message I think that we have to get across to people we work with is that you really shouldn't be afraid of stress. Um, stress is, essentially it's just a demand on some part of our body's physiology uh, that is an inevitable element of everyday life. Um, now, fortunately, most of these stressors are relatively minor and our body has appropriate stress response capabilities. And so when we feel the stressor of hunger, uh, we have a variety of brain and the rest of body systems that will help us get some food. Uh, when we feel stressed because we have a large project at work, we have a whole range of adaptations and solutions that we arrive at, and we respond to these stressors. It's, it's further, I think it's important to remember that not only is stress not bad for you, but the reality is stress is fundamentally uh, good for you if it is present in the right ways. And so we're gonna talk a little bit about the ways in which stress and the pattern of stress can lead to vulnerability and ways in which stress and the pattern of stress can lead to actually healthy development and uh, the creation of resilience, which is basically the ability to demonstrate in the face of significant stress, the capacity to respond and then return to a previous level of homeostasis or functioning. And you know, the, the term resilience is thrown out a lot. And I think sometimes talk, people talk about resilience without actually talking about what, what it is. Uh, they, they, there's sometimes I'll read something and it's as if people think that you can take a class to become resilient or that it's this power that some people can just summon uh, as opposed to other people. And that's just, a, I think, sort of an inaccuracy. So for the next few minutes, let's talk a little bit about this in more detail. First thing I want to emphasize is that, again, the, the pattern of stress is what is most important. And when somebody experiences uh, unpredictable, um, extreme or prolonged, uncontrollable stressors, uh, they develop a, a, a sensitization. And this sensitization is in some of the core stress response networks and systems in your brain and the rest of your body that result in vulnerability. It increases your risk for uh, emotional problems, cognitive challenges, social interaction issues, but also it increases your probability for other physical health issues like uh, vulnerability to diabetes and asthma and heart disease. And, and one of the things that most of you are aware of is that the, in the recent past, an increasing awareness of the ACE studies, the Adverse Childhood Experience Studies, 
have shown these correlations between uh, developmental adversity, which is basically something that can cause unpredictable, extreme, or prolonged activation of your stress response systems, and then subsequent uh, increased risk for social, emotional, physical, behavioral health problems. And so part of what we want to do during this current uh, event is to, to the degree possible, uh, try to shift these unpredictable and extreme prolonged activations over to more predictable, moderate, and controllable uh, activations of the stress response apparatus. And of course, it's easy for me to say, it's hard to do. But let's just take one last look at what happens when your stress reactivity curve is shifted by a pattern of stress activation. So most of us are somewhere within this neurotypical range. And basically what that means is if you end up having a little bit of stress, the kind of stress that might happen if you go to work and you have a new challenge at work, you're able to basically meet that with a mental, internal mental stat, state of being active alert. And really what that means is certain important parts of your brain are still open for business, that particularly cortical systems are open and available. You can use them to think and plan and solve whatever the moderate challenge is. If you are a student and you go to school and you get exposed to a new concept, a novelty uh, it, in and of itself activates the stress response, yet it doesn't do it to the degree that you're overwhelmed. If you are a neurotypically organized child, with a age appropriate and developmentally appropriate cognitive challenge, you'll have active alert uh, activation. You'll be able to internalize this, you'll be able to learn it, and you'll be able to move on. Unfortunately, if you have had a history of unpredictable, uncontrollable, or extreme prolonged stress, you have a sensitized stress response system. And what that means is even moderate stressors activate your stress response systems in your brain to the point that you, your brain basically says, I'm under threat. And when you're under threat, the first thing that happens is you'll start to shut down key cortical systems in your brain and you'll react in much more impulsive and reactive ways. And we're gonna have a future little bit, a mini webinar to talk about this in more detail. But <clears throat> the bottom line is at any given point in your life, you're going to have had some accumulation of different kinds of patterns of stress. And some of them will have been predictable and consistent and you'll sort of build up experiences here. And some of them will have been uncontrollable and extreme and prolonged and you'll have some experiences here. But most of us have essentially a whole catalog of experiences that build into us this neurotypical regulatory capability. And and so if you look at this vulnerability resilience continuum, most of us are basically neurotypically organized. Now let's think for a minute what's going to happen to the large group of neurotypically organized people uh, <clears throat> in the face of the current challenge. Now, <clears throat> if you are able to bring daily structure, family meals, limit your exposure to the unpredictable and activating media reports. If you have good uh, discipline about structured exercise, if you reach out and help other people, uh, if you basically have a positive mindset, all of these things will increase the probability that this experience is an opportunity to develop resilience. Now, I say that with hope. I, I realize that this is maybe a little Pollyannish. Uh, the reality is I think most of us are gonna be lucky if we're, we avoid becoming more sensitized. If we basically uh, have a good balance between unpredictability and predictability, we'll kind of stay where we are. Now, again, uh, I, it would be great if we could all develop resilience, but. Yeah, that's probably not going to happen. Now, so if you start here and you're neurotypically organized and you don't bring structure to your day, 
you're going to end up actually becoming vulnerable, more vulnerable, more anxious, more sensitized, more dysregulated. You're going to have disruptions that can influence your physical health and your mental health. And, and these are the kinds of things that will lead to that kind of vulnerability. Uh, if you don't exercise, if you let the media basically drive your emotional state, if you start to comfort eat and you don't have much structure to your day, these things uh, in this slide will it predictably shift you in the direction of vulnerability. Now, one of the things that we, uh, uh, you know, th that I've been talking about is that we're starting, what is this experience going to do for people who are neurotypically regulated, right? The truth is the vast majority of people that we work with in the mental health, child welfare, juvenile justice system, both the children, the youth, and the adults, their parents, are really not neurotypically regulated. Um, many of them have come from environments where they've grown up with extreme adversity. And so if you're starting this experience, this COVID-19 pandemic, and you are someone who's experienced in the past or are currently experiencing these adversities, it's highly likely that your stress reactivity curve has already got you in a vulnerable, vulnerable place. And so we need to think about how do we reach out and engage individuals who've had these experiences to at least keep them where they are. Uh, you know, it may be that some of them will, will, will be able to help them to the degree that they'll develop some improved regulatory capabilities and move towards the neurotypical uh, range. But I think most of the folks here are going to struggle mightily because under any crisis situation, this, the, the most marginalized, disenfranchised, uh, and the people that are at the bottom of a power differential are the ones that end up suffering the most. Now, here's where most of us, and not all, but many of us are, are over here. We, you know, we've, we're, we're privileged. And I think that there's no other event that I can think of that illustrates the privilege of many of us uh, than this current situation. Many of us have stable housing. We have meaningful work. We've got secure incomes, even though we may be taking a temporary economic hit. And, and you know, if you are lucky enough to be one of the folks that is in this moment, starting this experience, relatively capable of demonstrating resilience, it's, it's our moral obligation to do what we can to help those who are over here. Now, a lot of us have selected that as our work anyway. But I think part of what we need to do is recruit other folks to help us do this because it's going to be very challenging. Now, here's what I expect is going to happen to many of us. If this lasts as long as some people think and it is as challenging as some people model, those of us who have some pre-COVID baseline resilience are going to essentially feel a shift in our own regulatory capabilities. We're going to get pushed back towards neurotypical regulation. Uh, our ability to sort of manage challenges is gonna diminish. We're gonna feel like we're exhausted. We're gonna feel like we have no gas in our gas tank. It's gonna be tough. And, and, but be patient with yourself and remember that if this finishes, and we can bring more structure and predictability to the everyday stressors of our life and our work, we can get back to this point. But a lot of us are gonna drift over to this place. Again, the saddest thing and the thing that we really need to think very carefully about is individuals who start here. Because lo and behold, it, it, as much as we try and as much as there will be government attempts to sort of maintain work and help the most marginalized, I can guarantee you they're going to fall short. And this is what I predict is going to happen, is that the most marginalized vulnerable people in our society are going to be devastated by this. And this will have transgenerational consequences, not just in the way they feel and function emotionally and behaviorally, but really in their physical health, 
And then ultimately, I predict the physical health and the mental health and the social health of their offspring. And I think that this has a risk for becoming a transgenerational tsunami of risk. And if we don't act in a very intentional, thoughtful, and regulated way, we're not going to be able to stop this. And I have to say that the, the real crisis of this current pandemic is not necessarily the next six months. It really is, what are we going to do with the social and emotional toll that this is having on individuals and families who will remain the most marginalized for the next six decades? We'll talk some more about this stuff in our future sessions. For those of you who want more information, please take advantage of the things that we're posting online and particularly the COVID-19 specific content that's at neurosequential.com at COVID-19 resources. Thanks for the work you do. Take care of yourselves. Remember, stay physically separate, but emotionally close. Uh, I'll be back with another episode in the next week. Thank you.